one semester I got a gong and I actually hit it right against the book. It's really tough to get people's attention, such a big room. It's, uh, so the first thing to note is it is a big class. So if that is going to be a complaint, get it out of the way. Okay, this is not, it's no surprise. So I think there are some limited view seats in here. So I, it's like Yankee Stadium, you're behind the pole kind of thing. Okay. No, I think everybody can see the front. So let me first make sure you're in the right class. This is valuation. How many of you are also in my corporate finance class? God, you're going to be tortured so much this semester. You're going to see me twice every Monday and Wednesday and get twice as many emails. God help you. you know. But we're going to have some fun. So let me give you a little bit of history for both this class and me. I came to NYU in 1986. And when I came to NYU in 1986, they gave me a class to teach. It was a class called Security Analysis. Have you heard of this class? It's a legendary class. You know why it became legendary, right? It was taught by a guy called Ben Graham at Columbia University. And he had only five students. Must not have been a very good teacher, to be quite honest. No? But as a teacher, you're always blessed by your students. And one of his students, of course, turned out to be Warren Buffett. The other four were all great investors. So that was in the 1950s. The class kind of stayed on and on and on. Why? Because inertia is the strongest force in academia. Once something comes in, it never leaves. So in 1986, they gave me this class to teach. And it was already showing its age. It was four weeks on stocks and three weeks on bonds and two weeks on, you know, two weeks on futures and options and five weeks on institutional detail. Like what? There was an entire session on listing requirements for the New York Stock Exchange. You know what? Teaching was so easy in the days before Wikipedia. You could actually come list the 12 listing requirements, and people thought you were a genius. They took everything down. Today, if I tried that, you'd be checking Wikipedia while I did it. I took one look at the class, and I don't want to teach. It's like the most boring class ever. So I went to the head of my department, and I said, I don't want to teach this class. Not a great attitude for an assistant professor to take right after you've been hired. But he was a good guy. He said, what would you like to teach instead? I said, I'd like to teach a valuation class. He said, don't do it. There isn't enough stuff in valuation to fill a class. And you know what? He was absolutely right. In 1986, there wasn't enough stuff in valuation to fill a class. There were no other classes on valuation. There were no real books on valuation unless you wanted to go back to the 1950s and use security analysis over and over again. But I really, really wanted to teach this class. And I learned very early in my academic life that if you want to get anything done at a university, the best way to get it done is to do it subversively. Because if you try to get official permission, you know what would happen? A committee would be formed. <laughs> and once that happens, all is over. Because once a committee get, gets formed, it meets and it meets, and then it has baby committees, subcommittees, sub-subcommittees. They report to each other. There's this incestuous triangle that happens in there. And 35 years later, they'd come back and say, you can teach this class, but which time I'd have been ready to retire. So I said, OK, I'll teach your damn security analysis. I didn't use the word damn, but you know, the attitude came through. I'll teach a security analysis class. And I walked in and taught a valuation class. They have no idea what I do in here. At least now your cameras in 1986, they have absolutely no idea. I shut the door. I could have been teaching cooking for 15 weeks. <laughs> yeah. You know how long it took them to catch on? In 2008, <laughs> I get a call from the dean's office. They said, we hear you're teaching a valuation class. I said, yes, I've been doing it for 22 years. <laughs> they said, we don't see it anywhere on the schedule. I said, that's very easy to explain. I've been taking all these other classes you've been giving me and hijacking them and teaching valuation instead. In fact, for 15 years, they gave me a class called Equity Instruments and Markets. Now, I'll make a confession. I'm not that interested in markets. I don't like instruments, and I'm not particularly enamored with equities either. You take Equity Instruments and Markets, out of the, all you're left with is and. So I taught valuation instead. Spring of 2017, which is the last time I taught this class. I've been on a year and a half break. 
Don't you wish you had a job like mine? Just take a break, come back here in a half a year. And I've been missing this room intensely. Not. <laughs> I, don't, I miss teaching, but not this room. Yeah? Spring of 2017 was my 53rd semester teaching that class. This will be my 54th. And I'll say something about this class that's going to encapsulate how I think about valuation. Everything I know about valuation, I've learned in the course of teaching this class. Notice how I phrased that. The first semester I taught valuation, my syllabus ran only three weeks. People came and said, it's a 15-week class. I said, you know what? It's having this stuff for three weeks. After three weeks, something might happen, something might not. I figured out something to keep going, but I was three weeks ahead of my class. And over the 53 semesters I've taught this class, things have filled up. So I, trust me, there is enough stuff now in this class for me to go 15 weeks. But it's in the process of teaching this class that I filled it up. So here's what I'm going to do in today's session. I'm going to, lay, I'm going to set, set up the class. I'm going to go through the administrative details, what, the unpleasant stuff. You know what I'm talking about? Quizzes, exams, grades. You know, I could tell you this you know, usual if grades don't matter, it's the learning. Come on, your grades do matter. I know you care, so I'm not going to go. I'm not going to, you know, tell you that. So, but I have to get through that stuff because I want to get to the fun stuff, which is to talk about valuation. So let's get the administrative stuff going. My office is on the ninth floor of KMAC, you know, 969. Uh, my email address, and that's the easiest and best way to get me, is to email me. So is right there. My home page is my my entire website. It is a little big, so you can get lost. So I'm going to direct you to a part of the home page so you know where to go so you don't get lost. My office hours are around. I teach three classes on Mondays and Wednesdays, all in this room, all through the day. So I decided to keep the office hours on the same day. Why? Because I want to make my life easy. It's that and if I travel. But basically, the best time to catch me is actually not during office hours. It's a strange thing to say but actually catch me wherever I am in the building. I call, them, I call this my fair game principle. If you catch me, I'm fair game. So for the next 15 weeks, I'm going to try to keep away from you, and you find <laughs> me, right? But if you catch me on the street, on a subway, in the restroom, no, restrooms, let's take off, because that would be sexist, right? Only half of the population can find me. <laughs> no? So anywhere you find me, I'm fair game. Okay. On any question about valuation, and as you'll see, everything is a valuation-related question. The teaching assistants for the class at Chagusa and Vikram, they're, uh, I don't know whether they're here. Oh, they're, they're right there. So if you have any questions, you can, uh, you, can, you can ask me. I mean, in a sense, don't abuse them because all the grading comes through me. I, if, I, if I screw up, it's going to be, so bring your quizzes, exams. If you have a problem with the grading, bring them to me. But um, as we go through the semester, I'm going to use both of them as resources, especially if you are stuck on stuff that needs kind of re or, uh, no, re uh, basically things that you need to revisit from previous finance classes. So let's get the show on the road. Don't look at this because I'm giving away my answer. So I'm going to ask you a question. I should, let me go back to the previous page. I don't want you to read what's on the slide. So you ready? Here's my first question for you. You're saying already questions? Hey, let's get, let's get started. Is valuation an art or a science? How many of you think it's an art? Okay, how many of you think it's a science? Okay, I'm going to pick on you. Okay? And it's going to be easy. Let's pick something that is, there's no question about it being. Is mathematics a science? In fact, it's the only pure science. Mathematicians are convinced that the rest of us are imposters. So let's think about what it is about mathematics that makes it a science. What is it about mathematics that makes it a science? If we had that standard for a science, <laughs> social science is good. I mean, psychology could be a science. Sometimes you throw a number in there. Medicine could be a science. But what is it about mathematics? It's not just the using of numbers. It's something more in mathematics, right? What is it about mathematics that makes it a science? Yes? In other words, it is absolute. What's 2 plus 3? It's not a trick question. It's 5. No matter where in the universe you do it, what 
instrument to use. You could use a calculator, a computer, a supercomputer. Mathematics, if you get the inputs right, the outputs right. And if you get the output right, then you must have done something right. If the output's wrong, something's wrong. So mathematics is a science because if you get the inputs right, you get the output right. Physics is mostly a science, right? If we all gathered together, went up to the top floor of the building, 11th floor, we managed to get one of those windows open, we all jumped out. So I'm not suggesting mass suicide or something, but no, so, no. we don't fall in the order of our IQs or where we are in the corporate hierarchy or what our GPA is, we just fall. The laws of gravity are the laws of gravity. Physics is mostly a science. If the essence of a science, you get the inputs right, you get the output right. Now let me get back to this. Is valuation a science? What's the question I'm asking? If I get the inputs to valuing Apple right, am I going to get the value of Apple to be right as well? There's zero chance of it happening. I can get every single input right and be horribly wrong. You're saying, that is so terrible. Get used to it. In valuation, you can do everything right and be horribly wrong, and it's not your fault. Whose fault it is? The universe keeps moving. It throws shocks at us, surprises. Valuation has zero chance of ever being a science. So those people are holding on to hope. One of these days, we're going to have the stronger models, more data. It's going to be, let it go. Valuation is not a science. So it must be an art, right? So let's take, let's take something which where, where there's no debate about it being an art. Is painting an art? Not painting your house, you know, but I'm talking about painting portraits. Paint. Yeah, absolutely right. I remember taking my oldest son when he was eight. He's now 29, so it's a long time ago, to a Picasso exhibit that was going through the Met. So I wanted him to get a little culture. I'm so uncultured. Let him at least get some culture. So I take him in at 30 minutes. No, that's about how long he could last. And we come out and say, Ryan, what do you think of that? He said, Dad, I wasn't impressed. I said, what do you mean? That's a Picasso exhibit. He said, this guy can't get the nose in the right place. <laughs> you notice about Picassos? The nose out of the side of the head, the top of the head. It's almost like he was either drugged or drunk, which is probably true anyway. The essence of an art is you're either born with it or you don't have it. Art cannot be really taught. I mean, there are all these paint-by-numbers books you can get and say, I'm going to do something that looks just like a Picasso. Try it out. You're not getting $150 million for your paint-by-the-numbers. The essence of an art is you really cannot teach it. Thank God. Valuation is not an art. Because if it were, I wasted 32 years of my life and 54 semesters trying to teach something that cannot be taught. So it's not a science. It's not an art. What the heck is it? I'll give you the word I used to describe valuation. It is a craft. I'll give you the analogy, the, 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 the discipline I think comes closest to valuation, cooking. Let me ask you a question. How do you master cooking? You could do what my daughter does. I know recently she would watch the Food Network. She made it a spectator sport, chopped, you know, one show after the other. She couldn't cook a lick, but she could tell you in the abstract how to make a souffle. She'd seen it so many times on TV. But you don't learn cooking by watching TV, right? You don't learn cooking by reading cookbooks. You learn cooking by cooking. And the first time you cook, what happens? Disaster. I still remember the first time I scrambled eggs. Nobody told me I was supposed to spray the damn pan. <laughs> I finished scrambling the eggs. They looked really good, but they wouldn't come off the pan. Pan and eggs went in the trash can, but I learned a very important lesson. Always spray the pan before you put the eggs in there. You learn cooking by doing. And if all you do is scrambled eggs from now through eternity, you get really good at scrambling eggs, but that's the only thing you can cook. You learn valuation by doing. You know what that means, right? The next 15 weeks and 26 sessions are in a sense wasted because you're going to watch me talk about valuation. If you really want to learn valuation, you got to pick a company and value it. You're saying, I don't want to do it? You have no choice. I'm going to make you do it. <laughs> but it's going to be only one company. 
your learning is just going to begin during the course of this class. You want to be get better at valuation? Don't come and ask me what classes should I take after this one. Just pick another company and value it. Pick a third company and value it. I value about a company a week. And I tell you, I still, every time I value a company, learn something about valuation I did not know when I valued a company. The essence of a craft is you're never going to quite master it. Just when you think you're on top of things, something is going to change under you. And I have to remember that. I have to keep the door open to the fact that there are aspects of this craft that I still need to work on. So this is a work in progress. I reserve the right to change my mind on something I've written 10 times before. And I will do it in front of you. I say, look, you know, it's what I've been doing all this time. I don't think I should do that. Because that is the nature of valuation. I'll give you one very simple example, and you're going to see this play out probably in the 10th, 11th week. The way I learned to value companies, and I taught people how to value companies, was from the top down. You know what I mean, what I mean by that? To value a company, I project out revenues and income and cash flows to the entire company. Because that's the way companies built up value. They sold a lot of stuff, they showed a lot of revenues, hopefully profits and cash flows, and you value the company on that basis. And I followed that rubric pretty much for the 32 years I've taught this class. So about a year and a half ago, I valued Uber. Uber is a company I've been valuing over and over for the last five years. And I'll take you through some of those valuations. So I did my best judgment estimates on how much their revenues would be, you know, what, what their margins would be, cash flows. And I valued Uber. And I came up with a value of about $36 billion for the company. I posted this on my blog. You know why? Because it holds me accountable. So I post this on my blog. And when I post a valuation on my blog, I hear from a lot of people in good ways and bad ways. And of course, many of the, peop many of the people take issue with your assumptions. I think your revenue growth is too low. I think your margins are too high. To which my response is, if you don't like it, why don't you do it? Because I, my spreadsheets are open, so you basically can change the number. But one of the responses I got was not about my assumptions. It was about what I was doing to value Uber. He said, the, 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 the response said, you're using 20th century technology to value 21st century companies. And whenever I hear these words, I usually shut the email down because you know there's nothing more you can learn. But I kept reading, and thank God I did. He said, the 20th century companies built up their value by going for more revenues and more margins and more profits and deriving value from it. In the 21st century, companies are judged by their users, their subscribers, their members. We live in a Netflix, Amazon Prime world, not in a GE world. So his point was, you should be valuing Uber based on the number of riders and the customers they have, not based on looking at their total revenue. And my first response was, you know, I've been teaching valuation for 32 years. What do you know about valuation? And I started thinking about it, and I said, hey, you have a point. Because it's not just the Netflix and the Googles and the Facebooks that are all about the numbers, numbers of users. It's even companies that did not used to think in terms of numbers. You know what the crown jewel for Microsoft is right now? It's Office 365, which is a subscription model. If you have an Adobe product, notice you can't buy Adobe products now as software. You've got to, increasingly, you live on a subscription model. Just last month, I bought an AMC Movie Pass. You know how that works? AMC Movie Pass, instead of paying each time I go to the movies, I pay a monthly fee and I can get to see up to three, zero chance I'll ever get to three movies a week. But as long as I can see at least one movie a week, it pays for itself. It's a subscription model. So I said, you're right. The world does, it, so if you're Lime, the, the parent company for the scooters, their $2 billion pricing, and I'll talk a little bit about why I use that word rather than valuation, comes from what? Is it coming from how much money they made last year? How much money did Lime make last year? I don't even think they had revenues, to be quite honest. They were giving stuff away for free. This is a company where, if you look at the financials, they look abysmal. But you know what the $2 billion pricing is built on? The number of people who are using those scooters in different parts of the country. It's a numbers game. So I said, you're right. But the problem is not with the tools that I use. Because his, his point was, discounted cash flow valuation is the problem. 
What is discounted cash flow valuation? Say the value of an asset is the present value of the expected cash flows. It's agnostic about whether the asset is a company or a rider. So here's what I did. I took a U Uber rider and I valued a rider to Uber. Based on what? Based on cash flows, risk, and growth. This isn't rocket science. I valued a rider and then I valued the additional riders they go for because they're adding new riders and I value the company from the rider up. It was the best two weeks I've spent last, uh, I spent that year because I developed an architecture for valuing users, subscribers, and members. And you're going to see this play out when I value Uber. But you know, if you go to my blog, I used to value Netflix and Spotify, Amazon Prime. I now have a technology I can take anytime somebody talks about users. I can cut through the crap and say, okay, you have lots of users. Let's see how much they're worth. Because let's face it, you can have lots of users and it'll be an abysmally bad business, right? Like what? You guys read about MoviePass? The people who created this company should be rounded up and prevented from ever starting another business. It's the stupidest business idea you can think of. Anybody here buy MoviePass? You should because they gave away stuff. This is like Starbucks saying, for $10 a month you can have as many venti cappuccinos as you can have, as you want. For $9.99, you can watch as many movies, as, I think a movie a day, they restricted you to. You know what the cost of a ticket, the average cost of a ticket for a movie is in the country? It's $9.25. Forget it if you're in New York or... So one movie covers the entire subscription. Is this a great deal for moviegoers? Absolutely. But how do you build a business model by charging $9.99? So I was curious, how stupid can you be to build a business. So I kept watching out for the CEO of the company, who was, I think, certifiably insane or stupid or whatever it is. And this is how he justified it. He said that the average American goes to only six movies a year. You see, you see the logic that's going to flow out from this, right? Average American goes to only six movies a year. If we can charge $9.99, and the average American goes to only six movies a year, we're going to make a lot of money because we're going to be collecting $120, and they're going to, what was he missing? It's not the average American who's going to subscribe to Movie Pass. it is the movie crazy American. This insurance companies have known about this for centuries, right? You're going to get a selection bias. You're not pulling randomly from the population. But this is the problem. I think we live in a world where venture capitalists and private equity investors and startups have become so enamored with numbers, user numbers, subscriber numbers, that they've forgotten that ultimately you can have users and have no value, users and a lot of value, so I'm going to actually use Netflix and Spotify to illustrate how you can have two models that look similar from the outside and have very different valuations for a user. But I was able to do that because I was willing to say, you know what, maybe there's a different way of looking at this problem. So I wanted to keep that door open as we go through this class. If you say, there is a better way to value the company, open that door. The tools and techniques are here to value a company based on any premise you bring to that company. Valuation is a craft. In fact, one of the ways you're going to see this play out is once I, I'm, as I go through the syllabus, you're going to see one part of what you're going to be required to do each, each week is going to work on this craft part. Second, when you walked into this class, I assume you walked in because you want to value Apple and Microsoft and Uber. And we, we will value publicly traded companies. Obviously, that's a good place to start. You know why? Because the information is easy to get to. It's accessible. So, but we won't stop there. We're going to talk about valuing private businesses. We're going to value emerging market companies, developed market companies. We're going to value young companies and old companies. If all you did was value nice, mature companies, this class would last 15 minutes. And I'm not even sure you need a class to do this. Valuation really is about dealing with, for, in the way I describe this in valuation, for every rule there are 100 exceptions. So basically you gotta be flexible, you gotta be adaptable, and we're gonna be adaptable and look at all kinds of companies. We're gonna look at valuation through the eyes of investors, which is a logical place to start, but we're not gonna stop there. We're gonna look at valuation through the eyes of acquirers, through the eyes of managers, and see what might be different in valuing a company through the eyes of the manager. You know what the biggest difference is? 
What is the advantage that managers have that in, over investors when it comes to value of a company? Is they control the levers, right? If you're an investor investing in a company with no debt, you can sit there and put a target debt ratio if you feel like it, but let's face it, this is not your company. You can't change things just because you think they're better. But if you're a manager, you can change the way a company's run. In fact, this is where valuation and corporate finance kind of come together, because to me, corporate finance is valuation in a dynamic setting where I can stop and say, hey, this isn't the right way to do things. This might be a better way. What effect will that have on value? We're going to look at you know, valuations from all kinds of you know, all kinds of different viewpoints to see how, what are the difference. And we're not, not going to stop there. I'm going to draw a contrast, and you're going to see this in the next slide, between valuing something and pricing something. Value and price are words we use interchangeably, right? But they're very different concepts with very different meanings and requiring very different tools. What determines the value of a company or an asset? You don't need to do an no evaluation to answer. What are, the, what are the three things that determine the value of an asset? Cash flows, growth, and risk. We can dance around this as much as we want. We can develop discounted cash flow models, but the value of an asset is driven by cash flows, growth, and risk. And the tool you might use might be discounted cash flow valuation. So that's what you're expecting to see in this class, and you're going to see a lot of it. But what determines the price? of an asset. Demand and supply, right? What drives demand and supply? God only knows. It could be fundamentals, but it could also be mood, it could be momentum, it could be, I mean, everything. When we talk about behavior of finance, we're talking about how psychological factors can drive the price away from the value, but price is determined by demand and supply. And to price something, what do you need to do? You need to see what other people are paying for similar assets out there, right? So if I want to price a house, what do I do? I look at other houses in the neighborhood that I've sold and see what other people paid for them, and I base what I pay based on what other people pay. That's the pricing game. 90% of what passes for valuation out there. You know what I mean by out there? Once you go out of this room, you're going to talk about it. People say, I'm in valuation. How many of you plan to be in investment banking? You will never have to value anything because your job is not valuation. You know why? It's pricing. It's not bad. It's not good. It is what it is. If you're an investment banker and I come to you and say, I want to buy the target company, how much should I pay? You can do all the intrinsic valuation you want. But ultimately, you're playing a pricing game. That's the only way you can, you can tell everybody who comes in, you know, on an intrinsic value basis, nothing looks good. How long will you last as an M&A banker? Your job is to get transactions done, which means you're really trying to, you really should be doing pricing. But he's saying, I've seen discounted cash flow models used in acquisitions. Well, you're doing a lot of reverse engineering to get to the number you wanted to see, which was eight times EBITDA. Why are you wasting my time with your <laughs> stupid... The reality is there's a lot of delusion out there. People think that if they tell you, I price this company because that's what other people are paying, it doesn't sound sophisticated. So they feel the urge to spend weeks building this model to make it look like they're based on cash. Stop. Just tell me this is what you're paying because everybody's paying $100 per user. That's why you know, priced Lime at $2 billion. The reality is most of you, once you go out there, and if your job involves what you think is valuation, your job is really pricing. And the right tools for pricing are multiples and comparables. So if you use PE ratios, EV to EBITDA, all those, you're really doing pricing. So equity research, investment banking, much of the appraisal business is a pricing job. So we're going to spend six sessions talking about how to price things right. I'm not going to talk you out of saying, I'm not saying pricing is good or bad, it's just different. And if your job is pricing, it is silly to use a discounted cash flow model in the first place. That's like bringing a baseball bat to a soccer game. Actually, that's not a bad idea. You might be able to you know, beat up your defender and then run past him, but it's a wrong sport. So we're going to talk about how to do pricing right, and pricing is really statistics and data. And the problem with pricing now is we still act like it's 1966. 
How many times do you see people saying, I'm going to attach a value of 100 to this company because that's 10 times earnings. Why? Because that's the average PE for the sector. Hey, what about the rest of the data? 1966, you might say, the rest of the data? I can't pull that all. I don't have a spreadsheet and the Excel. You have the data. You have access to models. Let's use the data better. Let's play some money ball. So we're going to talk about pricing from the perspective of doing it better. Because if that's what your job is, that's what you need to do. I'm going to ask you my, your second question. There's no right answer to this question. So I want you to look inward. If I asked you to describe yourself as a person, would you more naturally describe yourself as a storyteller or a number cruncher? Think about it for a moment. What comes more easily to you, telling stories or working with numbers? You don't have to tell me because, as I said, there's no right answer. You say, how would I know? You've known for a long time. I knew when I was 12, right after my first English literature class. <laughs> I was asked to read Moby Dick, and I did. I was a good kid. I came ready for a discussion of whales and captains. And 15 minutes in the class, I noticed nobody was talking about the whale. So I put up my hand and said, when are we going to talk about the whale? And I remember what the instructor said. She said, there is no whale. I said, what? <laughs> Did I read the wrong book? I distinctly remember this big fish all the way through the book. She said, it's a metaphor. My jaw dropped. And the rest of the class was hidden meanings and things I didn't even know had a meaning in the first place. I'm sitting there saying, really? That's what Herman Melville was thinking when he wrote that. And I remember coming out of the class with a singular conclusion. I said, never again am I going to subject myself to that kind of bullshit. <laughs> and the rest of my high school life was laid out for me. I avoided the literature classes like the plague. It was Algebra 1, Algebra 2, Algebra 3, out of high school. <laughs> and I went to college. And these were the good old days. In the good old days, you didn't have this crappy core curriculum they make you take. You know what I'm talking about? For the first two years of college, they make you take all these classes. You're not in the least bit interested in. Why do I need to take a history class? It'll round out your education. That's a lie. It's really to keep the history department employed. <laughs> Those days, you could take numbers class, numbers class, numbers class, numbers degree. An engineer, a mathematician, a scientist, an accountant, a banker. How many of you are numbers people? Okay. You've got a numbers job. And you know why you're back here, right? Because after about four years of entering numbers and spreadsheets, you got sick and tired of doing this. So you quit and you came back to business school. OK. But in that same class that I walked out saying never again, there were people who were eating this up. They love the hidden meaning stuff. They're the poets. They're like my younger son. He writes poetry. Very good poetry, I've been told. <laughs> he showed me his first poem. And I don't think he's going to show me anymore. <laughs> he said, Dad, what do you think? And I looked at the poem, and I, you know, I was giving him constructive criticism. I said, you know what? Aren't the words supposed to rhyme? Because my vision of poetry got stuck when I was six in nursery rhymes. He gave me a look of total contempt and said, Dad, you're not a poet. And I said, you're right. So you took literature one, literature two, literature three, literature X, graduated, went off to Yale to become a history major. Then you graduated. Then you discovered that even Yale history majors don't get paid very much. <laughs> After about four or five years of poverty wages, you decided to quit, and you're back in business school, too. So you got the number crunches, you got the storytellers, you're all in there. And my guess is you're not sitting with each other. There's something about there's almost a tribe. The number crunches all hang out together, the storytellers. And you can't understand each other. You don't even know what the other side is talking about. And right now, the number crunches think they have the upper hand here, right? Since this is a valuation class, what the hell are you guys doing in here? I'm going to let you in on a secret that's been hidden in valuation. You know what the secret is? 
Evaluation can never just be about numbers. If all you have are numbers in a spreadsheet, please don't call this evaluation. You've gone through a modeling exercise and you've created a great spreadsheet, but it's not evaluation. If all you can do is tell me big stories, great, but it's not evaluation. A good valuation is a bridge between stories and numbers. Sounds fancy, right? But if you show me a spreadsheet with evaluation, and your revenues are 10 billion in year 10, and I point to the 10 billion and say, why are your revenues 10 billion in year 10? You know what the answer I don't want to hear is? It's because I used a 15% growth rate for the first five years and 8% thereafter. That is not the answer. I want a story about your company that explains why it can have 10 billion in revenues. Every number in your spreadsheet has to have a story attached to it. And every time you tell a story about a company, I want a number that goes with it. So if you want to talk about great management, I'm going to stop you after about 10 minutes of talking about the great management. Say, where in your numbers does that show up? You think that's impossible to do. I don't care how big and qualitative your story is. I view it as a challenge to find a number that goes with it. Because if I cannot find a number, I can't value it. So I'm going to give you my end game. Because left to yourselves, you're going to kind of hang out with people just like you. And you're all going to be convinced that your side is the right side. Because we, I mean, we all operate under our own delusions. Number crunchers think that they have a monopoly on precision and being objective. Story thinkers, storytellers think that they have the monopoly on being imaginative and creative. So here's my hope for this class. By the end of this class, I hope, if you're a storyteller, that you develop enough comfort with the numbers that you become a disciplined storyteller. Because the problem with storytelling is it's so easy to cross the line into fantasy land. Right? Because you can tell a story, you're so caught up in how big... You see those founders of companies, they get so carried away at some point in time, they've crossed the... They, 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 they're telling you the biggest fairy tale on the face of the earth. I hope you develop enough... So I'm looking for disciplined storytellers. And if you're a number cruncher, I hope by the end of this semester you're willing to trust your imagination. Because let's face it, you've spent a lifetime bludgeoning that thing into the ground. You've been told, if you tell a story, that's a sign of weakness. I'm looking for imaginative number crunchers or disciplined storytellers. You know which group I'm going to have more trouble with? I've taught this class, you know, as I said, 53 times. So I've run this experiment 53 times. Every single semester, which group do you think I have more trouble with? Getting number crunchers to let loose in their imagination or storytellers to get disciplined? The number crunchers. You give me 100 history majors. I can teach you enough valuation that you're going to be off to the races tomorrow. You give me 100 engineers, I am completely and totally screwed. <laughs> yeah. So if you're an engineer, my job is a lot more difficult with you because you're going to get these points of how do you know? The answer is I don't, but I've got to keep going. <laughs> how do I know I've got the right answer? You don't, but it's going to be OK. <laughs> it's a psychological war. You've got to fight and win because you're going to see. And don't worry, it'll happen in its own course as you, as you value companies. Finally, I told you that this valuation, that telling a story that this is the biggest secret in valuation. You know how big a secret it was? For the first six years, I taught valuation. I didn't know it. I taught valuation as a number cruncher did, which is, when in doubt, put up an equation. If you're still doubtful, put up a second. If you're still doubtful, make them simultaneous equations, solve for it. You feel much better about the whole process. About six years into this game, in 1992 or 93, I realized I had a problem. You know what my problem was? I had no faith in my own. Strange word to use, right? Faith. But think about why we do valuation. You have a price for a company. Let's say it's Apple. Stock's trading at 160. You value the company at 200. What should you be willing to do? Buy it, right? What does that require? Faith in two things. Faith that you have a value that you can live with. And faith, what's the second faith you need? That the price will adjust to the value, right? You're saying, why are you using the word faith? Because if you ask me to prove that my value is the right value, I can't prove it. If you ask me to prove that the price will move to the value, I can't do that either. So think of this almost like church. 
there is a God. I, you will get there eventually. But in a sense, that's faith. And that's something I can't endow you with over the next 15 weeks. I'll tell you something. My faith is not absolute. Nor it be my not be. My faith is tested all the time. I bought NVIDIA at 142 at the end of last year, last week. Early in the week, you know what happened to NVIDIA? It came out with its annual, uh, its, uh, its, 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 uh, its earnings report, announced that China's sales had dropped and Bitcoin people were going, jumping off roofs and their sales had dropped. The stock dropped $10. It went from 140 to 132. You know what that is? That's a market knocking on my door saying, do you still have faith? And I said, yes. But next week it would go to 120 market knocks again. Do you still have faith? Do you see why it's so difficult to invest in the abstract but to do it in the real world? Because a lot of people, the third time the market comes knocking, you're going to say, you know what? Maybe I screwed up. You know, so. so I'm going to take you through the process of how I got to my faith. And I'm not saying you will get to the same faith. Maybe you'll end this class saying, I have no faith. I'm going to just invest in an index fund perfectly okay. But faith is so key to valuation that it's something we need to talk about more openly. Why, when you value a company, are you willing to take a stand? Because you're not willing to act on a valuation. I don't see the point of this. I don't. And so I'm always, uh, uh, so when I value companies on my blog, and one of the critiques, in addition to people taking apart the numbers, is I'll be accused of being an academic which is not a good word, the way it's phrased. So you're an academic. And I don't even understand that. I actually act on my valuation. There's very little that's academic because you know, the reason I value companies is I want to act on them. So as we go through the next 15 weeks, I'll value companies in real time. And I will tell you, you will have no way of knowing whether I'm lying or making this up, that I bought the stock or sold the stock. I'm not doing this because I want you to do the same thing. You're not. You don't have enough money to push the price in the right direction. I can't do the front running. I'll do that on CNBC maybe, but that's uh, <laughs> <laughs> no. Actually, I won't do that either. <laughs> no, but I'm going to do this because I need you to see when I have enough faith to act and when I don't. And when I don't act, I need to tell you why I'm not acting. What is it about my valuation that's making me uncomfortable? Because knowing that will. And, and to people who say, I have no, I, I, I'm invited sometimes to go to Omaha. You know what happens in Omaha every year? It's value investing in Woodstock. <laughs> Instead of long, people with long hair singing rock, it's usually 70-year-old value investors who come out there and they worship at the altar of a 92-year-old with impulse control <laughs> and an 89-year-old who makes Yogi Berra look clear and precise. Um, but every year you know, in Omaha, they, they invite people for whatever reason. You know, I end up being on the invitee list. And when I said this, they said, "But you need absolute faith if you, you know." And I said, I, I, I told them about an episode from 40 years ago, when I heard Mother Teresa talk. I know she was giving a talk, and she said, "Every day, I wake up and I question the existence of God." And I said, "If Mother Teresa can wake up at the age of 75 and question the existence of God," I can wake up and say, did I make the right decision with NVIDIA? It seems like a much smaller question. <laughs> okay. But to me, the essence of faith is you have to be open to have it tested. Because otherwise, it's not faith. It's just dogma. Okay. So keep that in mind as we go through this class. Because those themes will come back over and over and over again. They underlie so much of what we do that they might be actually more important than knowing what equity risk premium to use or what beta to use. This, I think, is the bigger issue that you have to deal with. When you invest. So here's the structure for the class. We're going to spend the next two sessions setting the table. Next session, I'm going to lay out all the different ways that you can put a number on an asset. And there are not that many. There are only three. So I'll set up the table, set the table. Then the next eight sessions are, in a sense, going to be going back and making sure you remember your basics. Things like how to estimate discount rates, cash flows, growth rates, all those inputs. And during those sessions, you're going to get really impatient because I'm not going to value a single company. I'm going to take pieces of a company and do it. You say, when are we going to get to valuation? Until you do the hard work of getting the inputs right, let's not jump into valuation. Because once we get the inputs right, 
in four sessions. We're going to value company after company. We're going to spend about 10 minutes valuing each company. So basically, in those four sessions, we might value 40 companies, ranging from young companies to mature companies, declining companies, distressed companies, growth companies, emerging market companies. So I'll go all over the globe, essentially to illustrate that the process of valuation doesn't change just because you're valuing an Indian family group company as opposed to a US entertainment company. Then session 16 to 19, I'm going to talk about pricing, different multiples, how to use them right, how to make better use of the data we have. We have access to incredible data. We throw away so much of it. How many of you sold back your statistics textbooks the minute that class was over? Go buy that book back. Unfortunately, statistics, I think, does the wrong thing. They do stupid things like, what's the correlation between how much you eat and what you weigh? Let's stop with the absurd, stupid, obvious questions. Can you imagine how much more exciting statistics would be if we took all 43,000 publicly traded stocks and asked the question, hey, based on the data, which ones are most underpriced, which ones? Well, actually, make the statistics are actually worth its while. But so much of pricing is statistics and revisiting basics. Some of you will be a little frustrated because you really didn't get that regression stuff in the statistics class. In this class, we're going to make it applied. We're going to talk about why regressions are a good tool to have if your job is picking stocks. Then in session 20, I'm going to focus on valuing private companies. You know, only one session? Again, the mechanics of valuing a private company are no different than the mechanics of valuing a public company. The inputs are a little messier. And the owners are often fully invested in a single business. So we're going to adjust for that. But we're going to talk about how to make those adjustments. Session, to, uh, and we'll also, in session 19, do what I call asset-based valuation. You know what I mean by that? If you ask me to value GE as a company, one way to value it is look at the whole company, look at the revenues, the operating income, the cash flows, and value the whole company. You know the other way I could value the company? I could take each of the six businesses, and thank God it's only in six businesses, it used to be in 26 different businesses, value each business separately and add up the valuation. It's called sum of the parts valuation. And this is where I'm going to talk about valuing users and subscribers. I can value Netflix from the top down, looking at revenues, margins, cash flows, or I can value a Netflix subscriber in the bottom up. There are advantages and disadvantages, and we'll talk about those. Then for three sessions, we're going to bring in what is perhaps the only part of valuation that is new and different. Because for the first 19 to 20 sessions, nothing we do is very different from the way it's historically, in terms of new tools and techniques. But in those three sessions, 21 through 23, we're going to take option pricing models, which were built to value listed options, which are often short term, and traded in the CBOE. And we're going to apply them to value certain kinds of businesses, like what? natural resource companies with lots of undeveloped reserves. A pharmaceutical company with a patent working its way through the pipeline but doesn't have a product yet. It's a scalpel and it should be used selectively. You can't use it everywhere, but it's a useful tool to have with certain kinds of companies. Session 24, we're going to talk about valuing target companies and acquisitions. You're saying, is, is the rules different? Actually, the process is going to be the same for about 90% of the way, but then you bring in the two words that you often see in mergers that tips the scale. What are the two words? Control and synergy. And we're going to do it right. We're not going to add a 20% control premium, whatever other crap bankers do. We're going to value control. What's the value of control? And we're going to take synergy head on and say, what is synergy and how do we value it? And then I'm going to end a session, in session 25. I'm going to bring corporate finance and valuation. Because in the first 24 sessions, we're going to be passive. Passive in what sense? When you value a company, if it has low debt and it takes bad projects, we say, I'm going to value it as if it has low debt and bad projects. In session 25, I'm going to open the door, let you into the company, and you can run the company differently. So I'm going to talk about what can you do to change the value of a company. And session 26 is a grand finale. And we'll talk about what's going to be in the grand finale in a couple of minutes. This is too late because there's a preseason prep. But if you've been reading my emails, you got this preseason prep way back about two weeks, three weeks ago. Basically, these are the tools I hope you can bring into the class. It's not too late to catch up on them. The first is, I'll say some terribly mean things about accounting, and I'll mean every word of it. <laughs> but unfortunately, all of our raw data comes from where? accounting statements. We've got to think like accountants. And that's a scary thought. <laughs> because you've got to get out of that mindset really fast or eat away your brain cells. 
But we have to understand how do accountants treat different items because that raw data, you're going to use in valuation has to be best. Second, some basic statistics. Do you know what a what you know variance is? What a covariance is? What a regression does? I'm not going to ask you to run a regression, but I'm going to ask you to be able to read a regression. Let's face it, nobody runs regressions anymore. You have tools that do it. Excel does it. You've got SPSS that does it. Minitab does it. But you need to be able to read regressions. Don't worry. This is the basic stuff so that you can use statistics to do your pricing. And presumably, you've already taken foundations. I will assume you remembered nothing in foundations. Because I'll put my own spin on it. I'm not interested in portfolio theory for the sake of portfolio theory. I'm interested in portfolio theory to the extent that it gives me tools that I can use in valuation. So you're going to see a very pragmatic use of what I will find useful in finance. And it's very basic stuff. That first session you have in finance, present value, is perhaps the most useful class of the entire. Because in a sense, 80% of finance is present value. I mean, the rest of the class is about getting the cash flows and getting the discount rate, right? So if you still are struggling what the present value of an annuity, win the struggle. What that basically means is if your calculator's been running you, you need to be running your calculator. So, or if, you're, if your Excel spreadsheet PV button has been what you've been using as your black box, stop making it a black box. Start thinking about what it is you're doing in present value. I will take over your life for the next 15 weeks. In what sense? Here's how it'll go. So we have class today. In about half an hour after the class ends, you get an email from me. Doing what? Recapping the class. Why? Because you might have not been here. You might have been here and not been here. I mean, all kinds of different <laughs> combinations, right? right? So basically, recapping the class and sending what I call a post-class test. Don't freak out. It's five multiple choice questions. It'll take you about five minutes to answer relating to the class. Are you really there? So if you were really there and you can't answer the questions, maybe you need to go back and watch the class again. And that's, that's feasible. So I'll send a post-class test with a solution. So basically, every session will have a post-class test and solution. Incidentally, starting with the second session, you'll have a start of the class test. So get here on time. You think, that's crazy. What are you going to test before the class? I'm going to test you on what we're going to do during the session. Because you're going to discover, just from those tests, that you actually know what the answers are because much of it is common sense. So the start of the class test is to say, hey, look, I'm not going to tell you the answer. You can reason it yourself. It'll make the rest of the class sound like, hey, this guy is basically stating the obvious. And that's good. If I do that, then I've accomplished my objective. Tuesday, I'll put up a valuation of the week. I'm still thinking of what I should value. And say, but what's the valuation of the week? I'll pick something to value, usually a company. So tomorrow I might value Apple. Why? Because I feel it's all about me anyway. So I'll, I'm going to pick what I feel like valuing. So I might value Apple. So tomorrow you'll get an email saying, I just valued Apple. Here's my story. Here's my Excel spreadsheet. Why don't you try valuing Apple? And I have a Google Shared Spreadsheet link I will send where you can take what I've done and change what you don't like. So don't bitch and moan to me about why my growth rate is wrong, my discount rate. Just change it and put your value in there. Let's do a crowd valuation of Apple. How much of your grade rides on this? None. So you don't want to do this? Fine. You paid the tuition, I didn't. So you know, if it's, it's, it's up to you to get the return and investment that you feel. This is how you will learn valuation, though, because each week, I'll put a different company. So next week, I might value Vinamilk. You know what Vinamilk is? It's a Vietnamese milk company. You think what? Let's get as different from Apple as we can. You think you've done so? Each week I will throw a twist. In week three I might pick. Uh, not a, I might value Kim Kardashian <laughs> or LeBron James. In fact, a few years ago I valued Arian, Arian Foster. Who used to be a running back for the Houston. Uh, was it Houston? Texas. Houston Texans. They created a. Um, a tracking stock where you could actually buy a share of his earnings. It's kind of a dangerous place to be, right? Because in a, it's like 20, so you could actually buy 20% of his earnings. So I valued Arian, Arian Foster, the tracking stock. I valued the Clippers when Steve Ballmer bought it. 
So we'll throw, I mean, we'll throw everything in the ki but the kitchen sink and you know, everything that's, because in a sense, I want you to get familiar with all kinds of companies. And I'll tell you what's going to happen. Week one, when I put it, your reaction is going to be, but the class just started. I know nothing about valuation. You know what you're going to do? You're going to take my valuation. You're going to turn the change, change the third decimal point on the risk-free rate, and then come back and tell me that your value is just like mine. I'll create a histogram each week of your Google, of your Google valuations. And the first week, the histogram is going to be one bar right on my valuation, because nobody wants to disagree yet. You know what I? You know, how I know that this class is working is when week seven you come and tell me that you looked at my valuation and you don't like a single assumption I made. I said, good. That's the essence of valuation. You have a different story and a different valuation. Welcome to the game. You will find yourself more willing to disagree with me as you get more comfortable with the process. So take advantage of it. I'll put up a valuation of the week every week. There are no right answers. So don't say, when will he send the right answer? I don't know what the right answer is. I have my value, you have your value, there's a market price out there. And we can track it. On Wednesday, of course, we have class again, and you'll have the email after the class, recapping the class. On Thursday, you will have an email relating to a project you're doing for the class. You're saying, what project? There is a project, I'll describe it in a few minutes. But basically, this is my nagging email, because I know exactly what's going to happen. You're going to put this off till the 14th week. I know it's going to happen, but I have to act like it's not going to happen. So each week I'm going to say, are you there? So I'll send you a little timeline. This is where you're supposed to be, hoping, praying, that enough of you will, there'll be at least one Taipei personality in your group say, oh my God, look where we are. Look where we need to be. So it's a hope and prayer email, but I'll, I'll keep doing it every Thursday. On Friday, I will do what I call evaluation tools webcast. See, that sounds fancy. Like this week, I'm going to take a 10K. You know what a 10K is? A bunch of junk that accountants churn out, like a 1,000 pages. <laughs> and I'm going to take Procter & Gamble's 10K, and I'm going to say, these are the only 20 pages that matter, so I'm going to read a 10K. So I'm going to take a Procter & Gamble and say, this is how I decided what to use and what to throw out. Next week, I'm at, you know, we'll be talking about risk-free rates. So I'm going to estimate the, the risk-free rate in Zimbabwe. This is how I do it. So each week I will pick something specific and take you through. It's about 15 minutes. And essentially it's about applying something in this class on a real company. So you're not sitting there saying, oh, it's nice in the abstract, but how would I get a risk-free rate in Egyptian pounds? On Saturday you'll get a newsletter. There's not much news in there. But you know what it's going to tell you? This is where we are in the class. This is where we're. we think of it as a GPS that actually works, not a T-Mobile GPS that you know, the cell, cell service keeps getting dropped. It's essentially say, hey, this is where we are, this is where we're going. On Sunday, I forgot to mention, on Wednesday, I will send out what I call a weekly challenge. Again, no grade attached, but what I will do is take what we covered in the, the two sessions, Monday and Wednesday, and I'll write a challenge that kind of raises it one level, which is if you get the concept, let's see if you can try it on this, something that is, goes beyond just plugging numbers in. Because as I said, valuation is all about the exceptions, and I want you to get comfortable saying, hey, this is what I did. Again, no grades attached. I'll put the solution up on Sunday so you don't have to send me a solution. There's no, no, no submission needed. A lot of this, I'm going to assume that you will take what you need to. So this, I mean, people have described this class as trying to drink out of a, a hose because there's so much stuff. You will pick and choose. So I will assume that not all of you, will, that most of you will not use most of the stuff, but some of you will. So I want to at least give you access to things if you choose to go that extra step. And Sunday, I will put up my weekly challenge solution. So that Wednesday, Sunday link will go through the entire semester. Very few rules about this class. One is, you know, try to be here and try to be on time. But I'd rather that you be here than be on time. So if you're running behind, I'd still rather that you show up. So I'm not one of those people who's going to pick up you. You were 25 minutes late. Where were you? Hey, life happens, I understand. The Starbucks line was really long. <laughs> now, whatever it is, you know. So, you know. The only thing you need to bring to class with you is your lecture note packet. I've been bombarding you with how to get it. There are two ways you can get it. One is you can download the PDF. The other is if you feel rich and you want to throw your money away, you go to the bookstore and they'll charge you $25 for the same packet. The one thing you'd, I don't want you to do is download the PDF and then print it on, our, on the school printer because you know what's going to happen next. I will get a call saying, 400 people are printing 700 pages 
That's 28,000 pages. I would break every printer, and I've had this happen before. So if you're going to download the PDF and print it, if you're working part-time, do it at your employer's job. <laughs> uh, if you have a friend who works at Goldman, they don't even notice what's being printed. They have all this crap presentation they're printing. Print off a few hundred pages. <laughs> I mean, but there are three packets. All together, there are about 600 and something pages. And that's what this class is going to be structured around. If you do miss a class, come on, I'm a realist. I know you're going to miss classes for multiple reasons, good reasons or bad. One thing I'm not going to give you is an excuse saying I wasn't at that class because that excuse is off the table. Because if you miss a class, you can watch it. You can watch it as a stream from Media Site, which is the NYU stream. But for that, you need a good broadband and all the rest of the stuff. You can, if you, have, if you have an iPhone, you have cell service, I create a YouTube playlist of every single class. So you can download the, you know, so it's much easier if you're traveling to watch the YouTube playlist. I've also created it as a, you can also get a, a downloadable video file if you want to download it and watch it on a long plane ride, six lectures. That sounds horribly, almost like watching Batman versus Superman. In fact, if it's a choice between Batman versus Superman and this, watch this. It's better than Batman versus Superman, <laughs> right? But uh, you can down, or you can even download as an audio file. Why would you want to do that? Maybe you're, um, you know, you run the triathlon, and this will keep you going. Is multiple <laughs> audio lectures, now, whatever works for you. I don't care. You know? so it, it's in multiple formats. Pick the one that that you want, and eighty percent of the people who watch it from the class are actually people who are in the class. Because there might be a portion of the class. So in a, in a sense, you can. the advantage also is you can change the speed of the lecture to 4x. It's actually like watching Alvin and the Chipmunks talk about valuation. So if you want to watch the class in 27 minutes, it's high, you know, up the speed. Right? Incidentally, I keep all of this also as open source, just to show you that your tuition is not getting you that much of an add-on. So there are about 10,000 people watching with you every, every week for the next 15 weeks. And they're going to be in your Google shared spreadsheet for your valuations as well, because the more the merrier. So it'll be fun as, it go, as we go along. Nice to have, but you don't need it. You don't need a book. If you want, need, if you want one, I have five different books you can use. You know, I have my investment valuation, the third edition, the modern valuation, which was my very first book. Talk about ego, put your names. I remember you know, my publisher said, why do you call it the modern evaluation? I said, can I call it something else? It was when the O.J. Simpson trial was going on. Could I say O.J. Simpson and valuation? I could have sold a lot more books. You know? <laughs> <laughs> then there's the dark side of valuation, which is one of my favorites, because it's about value, difficult to value companies. The little book of valuation, which is called Little because it's little. It's like 200 pages, one of the wily little books. And finally, one of my, my most recent book is about connecting stories to numbers. So if you want to buy a book and you want to save money, the last two books are the $16 to $20. The first three, it's a, they're textbooks. You know how publishers play the stupid textbook game. I wouldn't pay the price if I were you. No, but don't tell my publisher that. So you, know, you, know, you can tell my publisher what you're going to do. It doesn't matter. No? Incidentally, if you have an iPhone or an iPad, I have uh, an app on the Apple Store called U Value that I co-developed with a friend of mine, Anand Sundram at Dartmouth, that does intrinsic valuation. It's actually so you're in, a, in an airport, your flight is delayed. Rather than doing what normal people do, which is go to the bathroom, get something to eat, you decide to value a company. You pull up your phone, you can 12 inputs. It'll do, it does a pretty good job of intrinsic valuation. In fact, I'll put it up against any banking valuation of a company. It's essential. It comes from the money back. Guarantee. You know why? It's free. <laughs> if you don't like it, tough. And if you have an Android, I pity you. But you know, not much I can do beyond that now. Yeah. We are, you know, I would tell you we're working on an app. But you know what? It's actually, you can't take an, an iPhone app and just make it an Android. You have to actually write the source code from scratch. And we already invested more money than we should have doing this. So if any of you want to make an Android app, you're welcome to build up the app. So we'll give you all the source code. You can do it yourself. But you don't, you don't have a, a, an Apple device, not much I can do with that app. Right? To stay connected to the class, my suggestion is the web page for the class that, that you see up there is where every, that's the center of the class. 
You say, what about NYU classes? What about it? I'm not even going to go into that site for the next 15 weeks, so it's going to stay dead for the next 15 weeks. The, the videos get posted there, but if you go make a, you know, if you go make an announcement in there or send me something, and then what, you, I won't even read it. So just go to the main web page because, in a sense, that's where everything resides. I w I've created a version of this class on iTunes U. Have, have any of you used it? It's an app. It's actually a neat app. It's a free app. You can download, and the whole class shows up. It's actually very well structured. So you see the video, the slides, the post class. Uh, so basically, everything related to the class. Right? So you if you go to iTunes U, and you can you know uh, you can again if you have an Android or a non Apple device, it's messier. There's a way to get the iTunes U but it's not as easy. And as I said, the YouTube playlist will have all the classes and slides as well. So multiple ways of getting to the class. The Google Calendar for the class, as some of you noted when I sent the first version of the calendar, I screwed up on, ca on time because I was setting up the calendar in San Diego. And I forgot time zones, and everything was set up in California time. So I started getting questions like, is the class really at 4.30? I said, no, what happened here? Turned out that, you know, I said, so I think I've fixed it now. So the Google Calendar should have the class times, but also the quiz dates and the final, and I'll come to that. If you're, uh, you know, as I said, almost everything I do in valuation that is at the margin, I put on my blog. So right now I'm doing a series of data updates, uh, data posts relating, because at the start of every year I update data globally. I do all kinds of but then I spend the first month of the year writing about what the numbers look like. So the, you, later today, I'm going to post on what debt ratios look like around the globe, what sectors look like, what changed in during the course of 2018. So the blog is really about valuation topics and about value companies. That's where you see them as well. And um, I, this morning when I was in my corporate finance class, I said my objective is to become the Lady Gaga of finance. She's got about 42 million followers. Or the Kanye West of valuation, he's got like 40 million, doesn't deserve that. I'm not even close, I'm at 90, uh, this morning I said it's 96,105, I just checked it's 96,200 now. I'm shooting six digits in my Twitter numbers, so I want you all to follow me and block me, because <laughs> I frankly don't care if you ever read a tweet, but I'm just gonna push purely. My, my objective in life is to always have more Facebook friends, even though I'm never on Facebook, more Twitter followers, and more LinkedIn connections than any of my kids. This is my revenge on my kids. <laughs> you think you're social media? I'm, you know. So, it, it, so if you want to join, if you want to follow my Twitter feed, you will, l because that's where I post whenever I do a blog post. So that's, that's my information disseminate. And in terms of, if you still have time on your hands, which I don't see how you could, and there are other readings you can get on the web page as well. Now let's get to the grading. I'm not going to give away any state secrets, but if you take a finance class, unlike a strategy class, we don't dish out 70% A's. So the, the breakdown of distribution here is 30 to 35% A's, and the way I'll come to a conclusion, if you can value just about everything, then you deserve an A. If you can value most things, you deserve a B. If you can value something, I would hope that can happen, then you deserve at least a C. If you can value nothing at the end of 15 weeks, and I've really screwed up and you've screwed up with me, we'll jointly fail the class. There aren't that many people who fail. You've got to really try to fail this class. Because if you do the stuff, there's no way at the end of the class that you can value nothing. You say, how are you going to decide whether you can value everything? That's what the, the structure of the class is built around. There is a group project, and I'll describe it in a minute. Okay? But the group project is worth 40%. It's going to be a valuation project that started as of the start of this class. It actually is already ongoing, and I'll describe why it's already ongoing. There'll be three quizzes and a final exam. The quiz dates are specified. Each quiz is worth 10%. The final exam is worth 30%. The final is scheduled, I think, for Monday, May 20th. So 30 plus 30 is 60%. And they're stretched out over the class. I think each quiz, is every, it's every four weeks. I used to give a midterm. The problem with midterms is by the time you do it and realize you really don't get this stuff, it's too late to change. Here, by the fourth week, you'll do your first quiz. And because one of the things you're going to notice about this class is while you're sitting in class, 
goodness, it's pretty, pretty strange. But until you start getting your hands dirty and working with the numbers, there are so many moving pieces that it's easy to screw up. Now you're saying, what if I miss a quiz? I'm going to be specific. You know why? With a large class, I don't want to be dealing with what happens if I miss a quiz. So here's what will happen. If you miss a quiz, you will not lose the 10%. It will get moved to the rest of your exams. Notice what I said, the rest of your exams. So if you miss quiz one, your quiz two, quiz three, and final will now be worth more proportionately. So it will become 12 and a half, 12 and a half, 35. Did I get that right? Whatever. So basically, it did not add up to 60%. If you miss the second quiz, it'll be the third quiz in the final. If you miss the third quiz, it'll go into the final. You know why I do that? It sounds convoluted. You say, why don't you just do it? Because I, I don't want strategic quiz missing. Because here's what'll happen. If you do really well in the first two quizzes then, you'll be tempted to miss the third quiz because it'll wait. May. So I've been playing this game a little longer than you have. <laughs> I've seen every trick under the, so. Basically, it's always going to be the rest of the class. The quizzes are open book, open notes, not open laptop. One of these days, I will create open laptops, and you will dread that day because my quizzes will actually get more difficult. It's open book, open notes. It's not multiple choice. And I will grade your quizzes. And it will be the first 30 minutes of class on the days that were specified. I have two other rooms I've reserved for those days. You know why? Look around you. Do you actually want to take a quiz with 400 people in this room? It'll be unbearable for you and me. So I will actually, I've actually got two other rooms, and about 150 of you will be, and I'll tell you before the quiz. You don't have to randomly decide which room you're in. It'll be based on where you are in the alphabet, and everybody will get one, one quiz away, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. However you do it, I'll try to be as fair as I can. But essentially, it'll be the first 30 minutes, and then there'll be class afterwards. And so open book, open notes, and if you do want to miss a quiz, the only thing I require of you is you tell me before the quiz. I'll be quite honest, you can make up reasons. I've listed out good reasons. You're sick, your spouse is sick, your kid is sick, your dog is sick, the Yankees lost, the Yankees won, the Red Sox, whatever it is. I re in fact, I'm not going to ask for doctor's notes. I'm going to trust you. Which means that if you really want to miss a quiz, you can miss the quiz, but you need to tell me before the quiz. You know why I need that again? Because again, there's another optionality that kicks in that I've got to watch out for. I know you're an honest person, but you sit down and do a quiz and you realize you've done really badly and you put it into your backpack and walk away. You say, oh, isn't that the, when I missed the quiz? I have no way of checking. So this way, if you're gonna miss the quiz, at least, so you, you have until 1029. I'm sorry, I, until 129 to tell me that you're missing the quiz. And if you miss a quiz, as I said, nothing horrific happens. The only thing you give up when you decide to miss a quiz, and this has to weigh somewhere in your, in your, in your, um, in your choice, is if you take all three quizzes, I will take your two best quizzes, and, and basically I will, I will throw away, I'll get, you get the option of throwing away your worst quiz. So even if you're not prepared for a quiz, you're actually better off taking the quiz and seeing what happens rather than missing the quiz. But as I said, it's, your, it's, it's a choice you can make. But try to take at least two of the three, because if you start missing more than two, then the weightings on the remaining exams become so large that mistakes get magnified. You can bring your iPads or your tablets in for reviewing your lecture notes, because if you downloaded them and you don't want to print them off, I don't want to cross rainforests in Brazil to kind of disappear, which is fine. But we are acting on an honor system because I realized we've got Wi-Fi, we've got iPads, trained things that can, I mean, so in a sense, there's nothing I can do to make this completely safe, but I'll try my best to make this as fair and open without kind of putting you at places where it's, you know, where I make you drop your phones and iPads at the door. I, I don't want to do that. Now let's talk about the project. I want each of you to join a group, find a group. Right? How many of you are second year MBAs? Okay, most of you. How many of you are not second year MBAs? There are enough of you that you can probably get together. How many of you are Langone? Okay. That's gonna be, in fact, keep your hands up because if you're Langone, 
this might be a very good group to start thinking because let's face it, you have time constraints. You have to work during the day. You might not be able to meet with other groups. It might be good to have a group which meet in the evening. I want you to find your own group. I will not find a group for you, and here's why. I don't want you to bitch and moan about your group because you don't like it. This way you live with your consequences. You police your own group. You think, how do I police it? Watch The Godfather. <laughs> Especially the scene with the horse's head on the pillow. You will find ways to get your group working on it. You think, what if I cannot find a group? On Wednesday, I will create I use Google Shared Spreadsheets a lot. I will create a Google Shared Spreadsheet called the Orphan List. <laughs> this is a very pathetic place to be. But if you, if you find yourself unable to find a group, you're being repelled by every group that you go to, or you repel them, you can go put your name on the orphan sheet. And the orphan sheet will collect other people just like you. And I will arrange therapists to meet each of you separately. No, I'm not <laughs> going to do that. No. But there'll be enough orphans, maybe, that you can create an orphan group. I'll tell you, historically, the orphan groups have done really well. Okay. So don't worry. You will find a group. <clears throat> On the quizzes, as I said, I'll grade, and I'll get them back to you as soon as I can, because I don't like holding quizzes. But let's talk a little bit about the project. <clears throat> We don't have very much time, but I'm just going to get it started. So here's what you're going to do in the project. You're going to pick a company. Okay. So each of you will pick a company. Not the whole group doesn't pick a company. Each of you, so if you're a group of five, you pick five companies. So a group of seven, seven companies. Each of you will pick a company. Any company you want, but I'm going to put a constraint on you. At least one of the companies in your group has to be a money losing company. Why? Because until you valued a losing company, you really haven't done valuation. At least one of the companies in your group has to be a high growth company. Revenue growth, doesn't even have to be earnings. At least one of your companies has to be a non US company. And at least one of your companies has to be a service company. And that's a very easy constraint to meet because 60% of companies are service companies. And remember, a single company can meet multiple criteria, right? So if you're a group of four and a fifth member wants to join in, one of the prices you can extract is you can give him the money losing, high growth, foreign company to value <laughs> and let him deal with all the consequences. Okay? But the constraints have to be met. And across the semester, here's what you're going to be doing. Everything we do in the class, you're going to do on your company. You're going to do an intrinsic valuation of your company, a discounted cash flow valuation. And that part, you're going to send me your spreadsheet on March 29th. It will not be great just for feedback. You know why I make you do this? You're at the, especially the MBA twos, are at the point in your MBAs where you might suffer from what I call premature graduation. <laughs> this is sometime in early March. You've, in your mind, graduated already. So, <laughs> You don't want to do any of the other work. So this is to kind of keep you working, because otherwise it gets really bad. And I will say, so this is purely for feedback. It's optional. You decide not to do it, fine. Then you live with the valuation. So you're going to be doing an intrinsic valuation of your company. In the second half of the class, you're going to do a pricing of your company, first against its peer group. What does that mean? Steel company against other steel companies. You might get more specific. US steel company against other US steel companies. Indian consumer product company against other Asian consumer product companies. So you're going to price it against a sector. You're also going to price it against the overall market. You're not quite clear what that difference is. We'll talk about why pricing against a sector can give you a different answer than pricing against the market. And if your company qualifies, you might even try an option pricing model. This will work for about one of every 10 companies. But in the first five steps, you're going to get an intrinsic valuation of pricing and perhaps an option value for your company. And the numbers can all be different. You think, so what? Well, in step six, you've got to tell me whether you're going to buy or sell the company. No Weasley words like strong buy, semi-strong buy, semi -strong. let's not play that. You either buy or you sell. Right? So I want you to make that decision. And you're saying, based on what? I'm going to let you make the decision. Because by the time you finish your intrinsic valuation pricing, you're going to trust one more than the other. I don't know which one. And you can make your decision based on that. 
and you're going to turn in on May 13th, which is the last day of class, before the class, what you found. Your intrinsic value, your pricing. Now, in, it's not, the final project report is not due until 5 o'clock that day, but the numbers. You know what the grand finale class is? I'm going to take all 400 of you. We're roughly 400 people in this class. I'm going to take all the numbers you send me on your value, your price, your buy, and I'm going to show you what the breakdown is in this class. How many said buy? How many said sell? And what it looks like relative to spring of 2000, because I have this number going back to spring of 1992. So you can actually see how the numbers shift over time and whether you're a good forecaster of what the market is doing. And I'm going to put up the 10 most undervalued, the 10 most overvalued. And I'm going to close the process by asking the 10 people who found the most undervalued stocks. I'm going to send a follow-up email saying, are you buying? You can give me two possible answers. No, yes. If you say no, I say OK. Then I'm not buying either. If you say yes, then I will look at your valuation. Because every semester I teach this class, I add one company to my portfolio based on what you find. But I'm doing it only if you have enough faith in your own valuation. And then I can reaffirm that faith to make sure you just put an extra zero and get carried away. So that's where the class is going, so you know what's coming. So next session, we're going to start on the meat and potatoes of this class. I don't have the packet that I handed out. This is a different packet. Two packets.